little Mick Jagger means only one thing here at Unlock the Middle. It must be Sunday night, Josh Tovar. And Sunday night's all about getting a little bit better together by reaching out across the country to find the greatest personalities we can find in education and try to tap into their brain a little bit. I'll tell you what, my name is Dean Packard. I am the proud principal of Charlton Middle School in Charlton, Massachusetts, one of the co-founders of Unlock the Middle. And alongside of me, I have my good friend and colleague over here from the great state of Texas, Josh Tovar. Josh, how are you tonight, my friend? Everything awesome, you know, just reflecting on you know, we didn't do it last week, so shame on us, Dean. We didn't wish our colleagues in the main chair happy principal happy day. Happy principal's day. Right, we didn't That's do right. that. You know what, so That's I right. hope you all enjoyed it. You know, we got, I got some shout outs there at school, so hope everyone enjoyed it. And coming up this week, you know, on Friday, well, no, wait, hold on. Friday was Cafeteria Workers Day. <laughs> shout out, Friday was Cafeteria Workers Day. And upcoming up, just looking forward to it. All oh, teacher appreciation week. Awesome things coming up around the corner at Memorial Park Academy and all over the United States. Making sure that we welcome everybody to the flagship show, knowing that you deserve all the kudos possible. Because you know what? You know what, Dean? It's been a trying year. It's been yeah, interesting. It <clears throat> it's been I an know. interesting year. You know, we're still recovering. We're still trying to find mm -hmm. our way. We're still trying to get our brand new team members in from outside of the teaching field, you know, the altered individuals coming in, taking those positions of the traditional factory style of hiring that we had the past couple of years, because you and I, we ain't no spring chickens. And you know, we've had that whole trend and it's changed for us even in the application process or the interview process. And I think that our guest tonight is someone that we really need to um, bring to the table because ISS, and we'll get into that right now, I won't even mention that. But it's one of those things that we need every single last part of education covered during this awesome flagship show where we have speakers and people that present theories, ideas, and we just take those little nuggets and put them part of our um, repertoire, our tool chest. And you know what? It's a great thing. And I don't know if you saw the tweet that I tagged you in, Dean, but there was a there was an a t a individual coming up to our voting site because Garden ISD, Garden USA. Passed a one billion dollar bond. One billion dollar bond. Thank you to all the people out there. And as she was entering our our, our uh, campus, she's like, "Oh, are you on a podcast with that handsome devil, Dean Packard from Come Massachusetts?" On, man. Oh yeah, bro. She Come recognized. On. You mean I have a fan down in Texas, bro? You have a fan, bro. You, you're all over. Let me tell wow. you. So things are going good. Principal's <laughs> Day, Cafeteria Worker Day. Teacher Appreciation Day, one billion week, one billion dollar bond pass. Things are going awesome in May for me. So that's the answer to the question, and I'm sticking to it, sir. I know you will, and I'll tell you what, you know, and I, I'm just thinking about tonight's topic and in-school suspension as a as a principal for you know a, a educational leader for 20 years. You know, the in-school suspension room has great opportunity to turn it to something positive. And you know, we think about it. We've been thinking about it as a student support team. How can we make it more? Uh, the word I'm looking for is more, it's real, like real for kids to develop an understanding of making choices. And that's what I'm looking forward to tonight when we talk to Jonathan and Carl about what they envision the in-school suspension room to be like. Because you know what? We don't want kids missing curriculum. We don't want kids outside of their, uh, outside of their learning community. Because think about it for a second. When you're disconnected from your learning community, nothing good happens really doesn't, unless you have something strategic in place to help them understand magnitude of choices creates roadmaps for you. And I'll tell you, that's something I get really excited about. Hey, whether you're in Alaska or Hawaii, North Dakota or Florida, Texas or Michigan, it doesn't matter. Please retweet this, uh, share it out, because you know what? We all get a little bit better together because of conversations such as this. Josh, did I miss anything? No, that's it. And I, and I agree with everything you said. And I'm looking forward to this topic because I was a SAC teacher in Texas, we call it SAC, in school suspension for one year. Sure. And 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 I did it for one year. And let me tell you, that's a hard gig. It's a very hard it gig. It is hard. It is hard. And not only that, is it a hard gig, but you know what? It's about making sure that the teachers feel comfortable sending work to you. Yeah. And then you provide the structure in the classroom that's loving. But, you know, it, it's I want to hear what has changed since the day of the abacus and Fred Pencil <laughs> days when I was in a, a SAC teacher. So let's bring on our guests. Well, we got two young guys, two visionaries in the field of education that are going to be more than happy to be able to share their viewpoints. So let's bring in Jonathan and Carl. 
Gentlemen, welcome to Unlock the Middle. Thanks for being with us tonight. First and foremost, how are both of you doing? Carl, why don't you start first? Oh, hey, thanks for having us, Dean and Josh. So nice to uh, meet you guys and get to spend an hour with you this evening. I love the enthusiasm. Um, just awesome. Awesome intro. It was great to be a part of that. Um, yeah, no, I'm doing good. Uh, I'm actually just uh, in the middle of of uh, baby bottles and baby diapers. I'm on uh, paternity leave right now. So I'm, <laughs> so I'm, I'm, this is a nice breath of fresh air, uh, <laughs> pun intended, um, to, <laughs> to be able to, uh, to be able to spend an hour with you guys. So thanks awesome for having stuff me. Right there. I remember those days vividly. Enjoy them. Even if they get, 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 get you caught up to your mind up to here, enjoy them because best time of your life ever. You don't know that yet. That's the advice I'm going to give to you. Jonathan, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you for having me. Uh, love your show. Love the energy. You guys are awesome. I uh, love what you said about students being disconnected from their learning community. That is That hit, hits home for me pretty hard because I know when we send them out away from school uh, to an alternative center or somewhere like that, it just it's an instant disconnect and uh, I'd rather keep them with us uh, than, than send them out. Um, and I'm doing well. I'm, uh, I'm the opposite of Carl's situation right now. I have a, a daughter who is also a middle school teacher. And uh, so no, no little ones in the house. We're, uh, we're actually doing, doing great in the empty nest. Oh, that's a great, great time of life as well, too. I, I can speak hi uh, highly of that. So, hey, guys, thank you so much. Listen, at this point in time, let's do this first. Tell the audience the origin of your story and kind of what roles served you in education. So kind of how you've risen to the ranks of where you are right now. And we know you're at home with uh, diapers and bottles right now, Carl. But let's talk about education and not that family thing yet. OK, because I know both of them have to coexist. So, Carl, why don't you start off just your, kind of your rise through where you're where you are, how you got there, things of that nature. Oh, cool. Thanks. Uh, yeah, so I've been in education since 2009. Um, I graduated. My undergrad degree was in um, international affairs, so I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do with it. So I got on an airplane, headed over to Korea, South Korea, and decided to teach for a year, uh, ESL. So I was teaching to uh, pre-K students up to second or third grade. Um, you know, I figured I was going to be there for a year. That That's all I would do. Um, you know, and then I'd head home and, you know, get my real job, start my career. Um, that was 10 years later that I finally started to do that. So I was actually in Asia uh, between South Korea and Taiwan for about 10 years teaching um, ESL. So I taught all, all shapes and sizes, pre-K all the way to 12th grade. I taught in large classes, small classes, small groups. I taught, um, you know, beginning English learners. I taught um, advanced learners. I taught essay writing. I taught uh, online. I taught uh, massive public schools, um, private schools all over the place. And then I came back to the States in uh, 2019, right before, just great timing, right before COVID hit. Um, and uh, so when I got back, um, I got back into education, um, was going to look, look for a job in uh, public education. And so I found something at Klein, where I'm at now, uh, in North Texas, and um, and I, I took took that job and, and then COVID hit and I've kind of just been flying by the seat of my pants since then. Um, so yeah, it's been, it's been a, a wild ride all over the place, but um, throughout the whole thing, I've been able to learn a lot about what it is that, you know, gets through the students and, and how we really cut through those filters. Um, you know, filters exist, barriers exist for language, barriers exist for behavior, barriers exist, all of it in different ways, right? So, um, you know, as, a, as an ESL teacher, um, in the background in ESL, reluctant readers, things like that, um, I've actually been able to transition pretty pretty seamlessly into behavior because we see those same kind of manifestations um, in disengagement uh, there. So it's been, um, yeah, so it's been, it's been fun. Um, and I, I'll ramble on a little bit. So if you ever need me to cut off, just give me a little wave. So <laughs> No, it's all good. It's a great lead in and it's a great, uh, great roadmap to where you are right now and what you're doing. And I, I love the love the fact that you talked about barriers. And we're going to talk more about that later on, I'm sure, because there are all kinds of barriers when it comes to education. And we want to make sure that we remove those barriers so kids can be successful, whether it's social, emotional, whether it's academic or whatever the case might be. That's our job as leaders. So thanks so much, Carl, for that. Jonathan. Hey, uh, my intro in education, I, I was one of those uh, alternative certification folks came in on the alt cert. Uh, to my district. I uh, did my, I have 11 years experience now in education. I spent the first seven on a therapeutic campus where every student had a label of emotional disturbance along with other things that would interfere with their learning. 
And now the last four years, I've been an in-school suspension teacher on two separate campuses. And I'm also author of The Art of In-School Suspension, the book, and executive co-director of The Art of ISS, of, uh, with executive co-directors with Carl over there, um, of The Art of ISS. And uh, we, our company, that's the company based on the book that we teach schools how to transform their in-school suspension into targeted behavior intervention with zero loss of instruction. Right, right there, you just had me, okay? Targeted interventions with zero loss of instruction. I absolutely love that because that is the most efficient use of an ISS room that there possibly could be. So thank, thank you for saying that. Josh. Gentlemen, hey, um, Carl, I like what you just said right now because that's our the home that I work in right now. It's all the kids that are coming in from El Salvador, Nicaragua, Honduras, Vietnam, Africa, different parts of uh, the Middle East. And so there is that behavior issue because it's frustration. It's frustration. I'm, I want to stick you, educator, in the middle of China. Tell me if you would not get frustrated. So they'd rather not work. But we'll get into that right now. The thing that, as everybody knows, and I know the dean always preaches this, is connections. Make a connection with a kid. So before we get into the whole aspect of ISS, the whole aspect of connecting with kids, Carl, Who's your role model in education? Who connected with you? Who do you look up to in education? Man, what a question. Put me on the spot, Josh. Um, I, I, you know, the first thing that popped in my head right away, just the moment you said that, um, I had a uh, high school teacher of mine. He's an English teacher and also a communications teacher of mine. And uh, he, he was my 10th grade teacher. He was also um, kind of, he, he, I was in a lot of theater, and so he was our director of theater arts and a lot of things like that. Um, and he was my role model for sure. Um, and he made us memorize something that stuck with me forever, and it's the definition of perception. And it was a it was an assignment for us. We had to memorize it, and so I did. And so he told us, and I still, you know, what twenty years later, I can still tell you the definition of perception as he told us. And it was perception is the way we filter and interpret what our senses tell us to create a meaningful picture of the world. And that was the definition that he had us memorize. And to me as an educator now for, um, I guess it's now going on 14 years, um, I've realized that if perception is the way we filter and interpret something, then what happens when our filter is clogged? What happens when we're blocked off from being able to interpret what our senses are telling us? And you know, we're, able, we're not able to move forward in any meaningful way and engage in anything. So in education, how do we engage in what is the, you know, the instructional core, as Richard Elmer, Elmer might say, is like the instructional core of teacher, student, and, and content. If there's a filter that's being blocked off from a student, student being able to access the content or being able to relate and have a relationship with the teacher, then we're not going to be able to get through the knowledge that we want to impart on those students, you know, all those teaks that we're always teaching here in Texas. Um, you know, we're not able to give that. So, um, like I said before, I, I, I'm, I'm able to uh, see the value in breaking through those filters or, you know, kind of getting through the, the difficulties and obstacles to education, um, not only in, as an ESL uh, teacher, but then also now in the behavior um, interventions that we do. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that. Um, Jonathan, who inspires you? Who motivates you, bro? Oh, that's an easy one. So I happen to be married to probably the best math teacher in the country. My wife, she's, uh, inspires me every day. I always tell people, you know, they, they, they love what I do. Um, but I'm, you know, I tell them, you know, the, the, all the talent in the family is in all the education talent is in her. She's the kind of educator who can take a child who hates, absolutely hates math. And by mid-semester, that is a child who loves math. So uh, she is my absolute uh, inspiration for education. and has been for my entire career. She was also a teacher first, so she kind of got me into it. That's good stuff right there. That's connecting. That's staying connected in the field of education. So really cool. And that's probably going to be your driving force. Gentlemen, quick question for you in this regard here. Um, you know, obviously you have this love for, I don't want to say love, you have this uh, aspiration to make in-house suspension a place that has meaning, relevancy, and really can help kids reflect upon not only decisions, but maybe um, restorative practices where they can't go back and do the same behavior over and over again. So let me ask you this. 
Um, how did you arrive at writing this book about ISS? Okay, so every day you're working in that in that domain, and you just said one day we're going to come together and write this book about ISS and try to get it out. Well, well, talk to us about that. And why don't we start with Jonathan this time? Sure, sure. Um, so the way it happened was, I you know I come to the in school suspension uh, job from uh, another campus within the district that was like I said behavior based. It was uh, for emotionally disturbed youth. And right away, I start implementing what I would consider common sense application for an in-school suspension room. And almost immediately, I start getting feedback from the teachers at the school and some of them who you know, barely know me, you know, we've only been going there a couple of weeks together, or, you know, maybe half the semester. And maybe I saw them at a training one time, but I'm stuck in ISS. So, you know, but they're stopping me in the hall and being like, hey, my kid got all of their work done for all three days that they were in ISS with you. That's amazing. And I'm like, oh, is that is that unusual? And they're like, yeah, that's that's unusual. And so, and I don't have other teachers would be like, hey, my student, all the zeros in the grade book are, are gone. They, they caught up on all their work. How do you get them to work? Question mark. And I'm like, okay, that's good. You know, it's, it's good to know. I, I, um, so I know that what's, you know, I know what we're doing is working and they're also having these different conversations around ISS. The teachers are telling me, the kids are saying stuff like, well, Mr. Cranford's cool, but I hate ISS. I don't want to go there. You know, I want to go back there. Um, but, you know, he, he, he does a good job. So I know we're onto something in the first year and it's going to evolve from there, but that was just year one and we're off to a good start. By year two, the district starts to notice and they start sending folks to my to my room a few at first just like some behavior specialists from the district uh an iss teacher or two for you know training uh them or to show them use me as a model iss room and then you know they bring in at some point uh, an entire other district that they're uh they're mentoring on pbis implementation so i have like a associate superintendent from this district in my room and like nine other people and there's more educators in my room than students that day and i'm like what is going on here i've never received this much attention in all of my years of teaching what's happening and so i start asking questions i'm like hey um are there other we have 12 middle schools in our district and five high schools and i'm asking them hey so is there other schools in our district that are that are doing a program like this and they're like well nobody's doing what you're doing and so the light bulb goes off and 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 we're in the Houston area, so there's about 35 districts surrounding um, HISD and, and, and us. And I know, you know, my, my wife's a teacher, my daughter's a teacher, my, most of my friends are teachers, so I know teachers all over the place. So I asked them, I'm like, hey, what's in-school suspension like at your school? And when you ask people that question, you generally get one of two answers. They're either going to say, ISS is a joke, the kids love to go there, they socialize, they play around on their phones, they play video games on their school issued laptop. It is incentivizing negative behaviors. Or they'll say, oh yeah, I think ISS is pretty good. And then, but then if you dig a little deeper and you ask them, well, quality of work you're getting back from instruction, how do you get the work to the teacher? You know, and then they'll be like, oh, well, we don't really expect work to come back, but he just makes them sit there and be quiet. And, you know, they don't like it, which, you know, that to me isn't school. That's just a room where children are sitting there doing time. So, I know that now in my area, it's not going, you know, the in-school suspension isn't, isn't really um, going how it should. So then I start to kind of do some research outside and I realize that this is actually a national issue. If you look at the data on in-school suspension, it's right there with OSS out of school suspension. It is, you know, it's, it's not beneficial. It's a negative experience. The kids away from, uh, or there, it's a, uh, it's, it's a negative impact on the child's learning, 100%, and it's not helping their behavior any. So, you, you know, it's not any better than sending them home for three days uh, or one day or whatever the punishment is. Uh, that's the data right now. And I know why, though. I was like, okay, let me look around and see what the, the data, the, uh, the, the information is on, you know, how to run ISS. And it turns out there really isn't any. Um, I looked at, you know, I did an Amazon search and, you know, there's books on why you shouldn't have ISS, why ISS is negative, things that you can do to pass the time in ISS activities, but there's no book on how to functionally manage and run an in-school suspension room successfully um, to this day that I'm aware of until I wrote the Art of In-School Suspension. So I, that's what I, I looked and saw that hole there and said, oh, I, I need to fix this. Perfect stuff right there. Carl. Yeah, no. So I, I when I joined, uh, Jonathan had already been doing his uh, his program that the, the book is uh, is based on and it elaborates on. And so when I went to his room, you know, he and I were just friends. We didn't really have any kind of 
uh, professional interaction other than, you know, I'd send a few students, a few students would go his way and I'd get the, you know, the work uh, prompt email that I have to send work in to, to have them complete. And I was noticing, you know, work is getting done. These students who I'm not able to effectively engage every single day, um, you know, it's hit or miss, maybe I get three out of five days of work out of this student. Um, but when he goes to the ISS room, he's coming back and he's got his work done. His work is completed. Um, you know, I go and I say, hey, you know, this this student so and so is has you know does he exhibit these sorts of behaviors in the room? And Jonathan always say the same thing. He's like, no, I you know, they don't do any of that. None of that happens, and not not in a in a braggadocious sort of way. Just a oh, I've never really experienced that with that student. So I was really intrigued, and I I would go by during planning periods when I wasn't in. Um, you know, my, uh, my PLCs or any of my other uh, teacher meetings. And I would just sit in there and I would just be floored by the fact that this was a structured environment with expectations that were being met consistently. And no, there were no raised voices. There was no yelling and screaming and you got to do this because oh, I don't, there was no talking down to students. There was no, you know, this is, this is how you should be acting and you're not acting that way. You know, the traditional, you know, I guess, uh, uh, two by four upside the head per, you know, proverbial two by four upside the head, like get your act together, sort of a thing that we had when we were, um, or when I was growing up, at least, um, there was just a non-judgmental redirection it was uh it was completely unenergized it was you're doing this behavior this is uh this is this consequence for that behavior i'm documenting that behavior and then that was the end of the discussion there was no power struggle there was no back and forth there was no explanation because i didn't know this until later but all of that had been described all of that had been explained to the students um beforehand so when you're in the middle of it um, it just is, it's already understood. The students understand it. So I think, you know, you mentioned um, getting to the point of, of SEL, social emotional learning, restorative practices, super important. And we've been very, very successful in our rooms at establishing that. None of that would be happening without this foundation of structure that Jonathan created that's in our book or his book that's in our company that we promote. Um, so, yeah, so it's, uh, I, I think that I think that ultimately, when we get to that conversation, it's just important to understand that um, all the other stuff that we're doing, the, the academic interventions, the behavior interventions, all of the SEL that we pack in towards the end of the day with these students and sprinkling throughout the day are there, but they're only there based on the structure that exists first and foremost. Thank you guys. And just, um... Let's go into the next step and let's get let's dive deeper into the weeds with this. All right. Before you do, I want to shout out to the people who are uh, posting questions here, Josh. Don't forget about that. Sean Moriarty, Oxford Middle School, Oxford, Massachusetts. Tim Cavey, uh, teachers on fire. We got him on the show here tonight with us. Um, we also had who else do we have pop in here just so we have it all correct? Um, going back here. Sean. Sean. Yeah, we already said Sean. That's good. Shoot your questions out. Marson, thank you very much for saying about your, uh, talking about your wife, the PhD Spanish teacher in Texas, the best Spanish teacher in Texas. I love to hear that as well. It's always a good thing. Sorry, Josh, just wanted to make sure we recognized our audience. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for doing that. Just real quick, gentlemen, one thing that you've learned sitting in our chair that not as long as Dean has, but sitting in our chair um, is that not everything's a 10. Not every behavior is a 10. And you don't send kids to ISS or send them home because that day you were like totally fed up with them. Not everything's a 10 because you chose not to provide structure in your classroom. I'm very adamant about that kind of stuff. And if we don't have a structured environment in ISS, let us know exactly. Let's go deep into this. Explain to a second year teacher that had problems with discipline, their first year teacher. We know that's where it happens, right? Talk to them why or talk to that first year assistant principal that's creating the master schedule already for next year, or that principal creating the master schedule for next year. Why or how can an ISS room fail kids, Jonathan? Let us know. All right, so here's the thing with in-school suspension. Um, when I ask people, what's the minimum expectation that you have for an in-school suspension room? And 
often well let me just ask you real quick josh like what would your minimum expectation be for the in-school suspension room it depends what angle you're asking me from if you're asking me from the assistant principal that mm -hmm. i have a trail of referrals because of there's other you see it's a, it's a system problem mm -hmm. it's a culture problem if you have a lot of kids in iss that's the assistant that's the principal's problem because you're not providing the right culture and guidance on there i, I don't want to get into that because then i i get on my soapbox all right <laughs> but in, in regards to uh, an administrator what i would want from there is to make sure that not only do you connect with a kid because you really have a small teacher to student ratio but also try to make sure that we refocus him or her on their academics while they're in there because mm -hmm. they, they're away from cell phones they're away from the noise of a middle school of a high school and you you have that loving time to connect with them and really get into them that's probably why they're successful with you jonathan because you break down that one in one con connection Meet them where so as an administrator that's what i want as a teacher i want you to pull their nails uh hog tie them i want you to gag them no no because they got to come back to your room hello they got to come back to you so what are you doing in the classroom so uh, hopefully I, I answered your question. Well, what you described was actually a very highly functional in-school suspension room. When I say, what is the low bar? What is your minimum expectation? Most people will just say that it would be a consequence for negative behavior. And I would say that the bar is actually lower, okay? Because what it needs to be is at least at minimum, because it can be much worse, at minimum, it can be a reward for negative behavior. And that's what I describe when I'm talking about a room where kids are socializing, they're on their phones, um, they're watching Marvel movies on their Chromebooks or whatever. Um, you're incentivizing those students to, you know, because you just don't have structure and control. You have uh, students who are now like, hey, this is way better than going to that Spanish class that I hate. And then, so now you have a, a room where the child is incentivized from their bad, they'll actually, I've seen it where, you know, people have told me, oh, the kids at our school, they get together and plan when they're going to get ISS and try to get it together because it's just, it's just a, you know, it's a good time for them. They can all hang out in there because they just don't have instructional control of the room. And so uh, what happens in that situation is not only does it fail the students who are, who are, you know, completely missing instruction for the days that they're in in school suspension, but now you've got emboldened behaviors. So they, you know, they're like, oh, it's not a big deal. There really is no other, other um, consequence for them. You know, OSS is a joke. They're going to go home and, and scroll TikTok all day long. Yep. ISS shouldn't be, but it can be. Um, that leads to something horrible, which is what I would call like the metastatization of um, those behaviors into other classrooms, right? So you've got kids who feel like who learn from spending a couple of days in ISS that they just... There is no real consequence for them to receive. Um, ISS is actually kind of fun. So now my behaviors are gonna spread to other classrooms that had decent classroom management, but because there's really no backstop now, it just gets worse. And by the end of the year, it can just get worse and worse and worse, which can affect your culture of your building. It can affect teacher retention. Um, it affects the, the, the tension between the teachers and the admin. Um, it's actually a big problem. Um, when it fails the students, it fails the whole school. You know, before Carl goes, have either one of you ever thought about adding additional time on the day as a, we'll call it a, a great awakening outside of uh, just the in-school suspension? You know, when kids are having fun in school, the regular school day ends. You know, I always thought if I added an extra hour to their day while everybody else goes home, there might be a, a deeper bite to understanding. It's not as fun as they think. Thoughts Let me, that? sure, sure. So here's, here's how I run it. Um, and how Carl runs his as well, is the only, the only, if you fail to complete your day of in-school suspension, um, to my, to our expectations, um, we have kind of a three strikes and you're out um, situation, but it's really, it's not just one, two, three, and you're out. It doesn't work that way. It's, it's, it's much more complicated than that, or much more complex than that. Um, we have a very, very detailed how we redirect behavior, how we document behavior. But if you do earn three strikes by the end of the day, which takes a long time to do, it's, you almost have to really try to be earning your three strikes, um, then you have not successfully completed the day of ISS. The only thing I have for you guys is another day of ISS. <laughs> so I have a deal with my APs where I'm like, hey, if this kid doesn't make it, you know, I'm not saying, hey, get this kid out of here as much as possible, no matter how difficult they are. I'm saying give them back to me. Um, I want that child for one more day. 
Uh, and the way in school suspension, the, the, the overall experience of the student is actually this one day with us isn't really bad. Um, you know, it's, it's a lot of times it's the first day is novel and they actually, you know, they leave like, oh, that was, that was okay. Um, by day three, it's brutal. They just want it to be over with because it's just, you know, nothing changes. It is, um, you know, nothing's going on in there except we do our work and, you know, we just follow our schedule and it's pretty, it's pretty simple. Um, they, you know, so, you know, it's not like it's some draconian punishment, but by day three, they want to go. There's nothing going on inside that room that's any different. And, um, you know, so if there's a fourth day added on, usually then, you know, the really, the ones who need a little bit more, um, uh, the, we call it tier two, they, they need to, they, they, they're not going to get it necessarily on the first try. They're not going to figure things out. It's going to take them a little bit longer. Um, by day four, they're like really ready to get out. And, you know, when you want to change tier two behaviors, um, you know, it's kind of, that's, that's, that's what we're talking about here. When we talk about SEL and we talk about, you know, the PBIS and all that stuff, that is great stuff. And, um, and it works on tier one type students really well. Um, SEL works across the board. It's, it's important, but it's not the only thing. There's this one piece that we keep leaving out of it. And it's the understanding between the difference between a tier one type student and a tier two. Uh, you know, tier one student, you do the PBIS stuff, you know, anything is going to work. You give them one day of ISS and they're like, oh man, I just, the fact that I was received a consequence is typically something that they just, that's enough to make them change their behavior with a tier two type student. Their history is typically, and this is just a generalization, I know all students are different, um, but their history is generally that they have these behaviors that have been serving them for a very long time, for whatever reason, in school. And you don't just stop doing all that stuff at 13 because somebody gives you a pat on the back. They, if they can tell you what they did that was wrong, if they made a mistake, if they're in your office and you're like, hey, what should you have done in this situation? And by the middle school, most of them can. They can tell you exactly what they should have done. So you know it's not a skill issue that we're talking here. It's not, um, it's not a character education issue. They knew what they should have done. So now what we're looking at is a tier two who needs to associate a behavior with the consequence. That's the thing that they need. They need to understand that this behavior is, gonna, is going to get this consequence, not a draconian consequence where they miss instruction and they just sit in a room staring at a wall all day. That's not what we do. We focus on academics and we provide an academic intervention while we're providing a targeted behavior intervention. Um, but they need to have that there. So what you see with these tier twos, you know, tier one, you put them in there for one day, you probably don't see them again all year. I have a lot of kids like that. They make a, they make a dumb impulse buy. Um, skip a class or something, they're in there one day, never see them again the rest of the year. Tier two, you're going to see them a couple times throughout the year, but what you will notice is if they're using the room properly, meaning, you know, they're getting three days, you know, at a time, if they're, you know, if they need it, you know, we, we recognize that this student one day isn't going to do it for them. They're going to need a little bit more time in there to really, to, to, to really feel it. Um, and, you know, they, 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 you might, it might take a semester, it might take all year, but by the end of the year, they're going to be, they're going to modify their behavior because they don't want to keep, keep getting ISS and they're going to be all better off academically because of the amount of one-to-one -one time we spend with them, um, working on not just their schoolwork that they currently have, but working on skills that they missed in fourth grade, third grade, fifth grade. Um, you know, that's what we, that's what we really tend to focus on. That's how, that's how we approach it. Um, and I think that's what's been missing is, you know, we have to understand that SEL has its place and it is a part of our big part of our program and it's important, but for a tier two student, they need to associate the behavior with the consequence. I love that. Carl, I don't think you left much for you to say, but uh, feel free to add into it if you'd like. Well, I, you know, I was reflecting a little bit on the question of, you know, what would you, what would an ideal ISS or what would be the, the goal of ISS or what would you want the functional ISS room to be like? And I think that, you know, something that Josh said too kind of sticks with me is that it really just depends on from which lens you're, you're, you're looking at the room, right? So from the student's lens, what's an ideal uh, day of ISS? Because we know that, you know, obviously to them, we do hear the same thing over and over again. I don't ever want to come back here. I don't want to be in this room anymore, but I love you. I think you're a great teacher. You're one of my favorite teachers. We get all that stuff. You know, that's exactly like from my perspective, exactly what I want. I want a student who does not want to be in that room with us again. They don't want to have that consequence again, but, um, but that they actually do care and understand because we're building connections all the time, all the time with our students. But so from a student's perspective, what would an ideal day of ISS be? Um, it's what I tell them in the beginning of the day. At nine o'clock, we go over expectations, you know, and I say, listen, guys, you guys all walked in here at 9 a.m. having failed at something, right? Whether that's, 
an interaction you had with a peer, with an adult, with a decision, a decision that you made at a single time. Maybe it's a habitual issue with you. You just continually can't get past this one interaction. You don't know what to do. Whatever it is that you failed at this thing at 9 a.m., you walked in here that way. It doesn't make you a failure. It means that you failed at something. And everybody fails at things. Everyone makes mistakes. At 4.10, which is when our day is done, um, at 4.10, if you successfully navigate the day without receiving three strikes, you've been successful. You have succeeded at something. And maybe, just maybe, you haven't felt a lot of success this year or this week or this month. So to me, for a student, um, if I were, you know, objective as a student about what is best for me in my future, I'd want a room where I could be held accountable for the actions that I've taken, but also made to feel like I can build upon a success that will mean something for me tomorrow, not just for today, not just getting through these last eight hours and, you know, dealing with the fact that I had to be in this room. But what did I do? What successes did I have academically today? What skills did I learn? What gaps were filled for me? Um, what tools do I now have to navigate that social interaction that I just don't like in second period? What am I going to do in the future? And I, I'll speak uh, more to the behavior reflection piece, the SEL piece that we talk about later. But, um, you know, what am I going to use uh, from this interaction to be to continue to be successful? You know, uh, first and foremost, failing forward. Thanks, Mel. I appreciate you being here tonight. I love that. That's a great line. Something we all need to think about. But, you know, guys, you, you're not thinking punitively. You're thinking restoratively. And that's a big mind shift because when I got in the game a long time ago, like, like Josh said earlier, it was about um, holding kids accountable. And we want them to feel it. We want them to make it make it burn a little bit. But the idea of that doing doing that today is so wrong. I mean, you want to make sure kids feel as though they're part of their overall learning community, not ostracized because of a mistake. For crying out loud, I know 50-year-olds that make mistakes every single day. What happens to them in their real life? They get a chance to be have another opportunity. So again, when we're talking to staff, we have to make sure they understand these are your kids for 180 days. We don't want to create a relationship that is less than welcoming. How's that sound? And it's something they have to digest, but there'll be speed bumps in the room. So so that, that all happens. Let's talk about teacher retention because of ISS. One of the things that, you know, Josh had mentioned here is we're losing teachers because of this regulation in class, because kids are getting in trouble. And, and maybe if you think about it, if an in-school suspension room isn't systemized well enough, they're saying the kids aren't getting it. They're, they're doing the same behaviors over and over again. So let's talk about how that might affect teachers staying in the profession and knowing that there is a system of support to help kids make better decisions. And Carl, why don't you start off? Um, yeah, I was just reading one of our comments from the thing. So the last, the last uh, part of that question that you said was about teacher retention. Am I correct? So just yeah. in terms of how are we as a as an ISS room, a functional ISS room, supporting um, building on teacher retention, making sure teachers aren't feeling that burnout based on those behaviors that are existing in their classrooms, that sort of thing. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. So it's a great question. I think we talked a little bit about before Jonathan mentioned, um, Jonathan mentioned the ripple effect, right? So for us, it really is about a ripple effect. We, uh, I know we've had conversations like this and I'm a firm believer that you could have a room, a school that is struggling in almost every area. But if you have a few dedicated administrators and a, and a willing ISS teacher, you can have a functional room that is going to have positive impacts outside of the room, right? So again, having this room be a real consequence for a behavior, not a, like you said, punitive, but in a, in a real sense of them understanding what it is that they've done and why what they did needs a response from the school. Um, but then also it's a room where they're able to grow and learn from those behaviors or from that consequence, at least, into what is that going to mean in their classroom. And I'll tell you specifically as a support for my campus, because we have, as an ISS room, you have fluctuating census. You have large numbers some days, small numbers other days, right? So as a willing teacher, I want to be as supportive as possible to all of my other teachers, right? So not only is it what am I doing in my room to help reduce the recidivism rate of students who are continually acting out in struggling in those classroom management, you know, difficult situations in their in their regular classes, but also what can I do to help support a teacher who does struggle with a particular student that I happen to have a relationship with? 
So we do a couple different things uh, in my room. I have something that I call wraparound, right? So once I have a student who I've met and I've gotten to know and I have a, a built a relationship with, I, I will talk to that student and I'll talk to their teachers. If that student is struggling with behaviors in that teacher's class, I'm going to have them do a wraparound with me. And what that means is I want them to come in and check in with me in the beginning of the day at some point. They're going to come during passing period or whatever it is. Then I want them to check in with me one more time after their teacher's class, the teacher that they're struggling in. They'll check in with me then too. And then from there, I'm gonna communicate with that teacher and find out does that teacher feel like they're actually making positive progress in the class? Are they continuing to have those same sorts of uh, negative behaviors in your classroom? If they are, we can kind of move forward from there, right? So we've got this first, this little kind of, it's like the set, it's called a wraparound, gives them this idea of like, I'm gonna check in with this teacher that I trust a couple times throughout the day. I'm gonna go and I'm gonna be honest. I'm gonna say, yeah, I am struggling with this, or I have these friends in my class and I am struggling. I'm gonna communicate with that teacher as well and say, is Johnny still doing those things that, you know, you've been struggling you've been you've been challenged with this year and if he is then we're going to we're going to look for other other means um to the point of where i will have them send me that student into the room periodically now it's not a crutch it's not an everyday thing it can't be i'm not an administrator i don't have the authority to remove the student from the room but if i talk to that teacher and say hey during independent work time send johnny down have him sit with me for this class we're going to have a conversation one on one. He's not in trouble. He's not serving ISS, but he needs additional support. One, he's learning that I care about him, that I care enough to add to my plate for him, not to make him feel any sort of what sort of way. I don't that's not what it's about. It's I want you to be successful. So I'm going to show you how you can be. I want the teacher to know that you can use me as a resource whenever possible to help with those challenging behaviors. And then on top of that, just as a structured room of, of uh, intervention, we're able to kind of help with the stresses. You know, one probably one area where we find um, the most direct impact, sorry, my dog keeps jumping on me. Um, the most direct impact is, um, is towards the end of the nine work nine week marking period, right, or uh, um, grading period, right. So if I have students who are struggling and they're coming into ISS, and we've got a teacher who needs that student to complete certain assignments, they come to the ISS room, they know that stuff's going to get done. They're a little bit, just a little bit less stressed, right. So you know we don't pretend to to say that we are waving a magic wand and everything is perfect and all of our teachers are loving every minute of their time in our school because of our ISS rooms. That's not what it's about. What it's about is just giving a little bit, just give a little bit extra to maybe lessen and maybe help another person navigate their difficult time as a teacher. Because as everybody knows, it is hard to be a classroom teacher. It is. And we call that a calibration moment. I love that you do that because, you know, by state law, we all know that they have, as soon as a student is regulated, they need to return back to the, the certified teacher and you just can't keep them out of their um, element. However, you know, we call those timeouts and kids can really benefit from a timeout and a, and a champion. And what you're saying, Carl, is you become a champion for that kid. And every student should have one or two champions in their corner every time they walk into a public school. So I am so glad you mentioned that. Jonathan, you want to take it to another level? Sure. Uh, so Carl was speaking to how he can come in and support those teachers um, that so that they do stay. Um, when it comes to teacher retention, I'll just kind of take the angle of you know the teachers and why they would you know possibly want to leave. And it, it's pretty simple um, why they get frustrated. And it goes like this: You're a school teacher, regular classroom, say a core content like you know um, math or ELA, and you're trying to teach, and you've got these uh, chronic behaviors in your classroom. So you start implementing what you have to do, uh, take the steps, you know, run through the behavior ladder, start, you know, giving um, you know, warnings and maybe even parent contact or whatever. And then eventually it gets to the point where you have to do a write-up. And uh, in order to do a write-up, uh, at least, you know, in our, in our district, you have to contact the parent again and let them know like, hey, I'm going to do this write-up. And, you know, you have to contact your admin and, and you, know, you send it on. And then there's a, an investigation by the by the AP probably. And then they will assign They have to contact the parent also to assign a contract. So a lot of time has been spent now on this one child's behavior. 
so from a teacher perspective, that is, you know, that is their top concern for that class. Um, for, you know, for the AP, that is, you know, their 70th top concern um, because they have to deal with so many of these. And uh, what then happens if you have a non-functional ISS room is maybe the kid goes for, you know, a little while and they come back and they didn't serve a true consequence because, you know, they were playing and watching Marvel movies on their phone. And now they're also three days behind in instruction. That is frustrating. Um, that is a grind. And then what happens is, you know, the, the, the behaviors might even increase in that classroom. Um, the teacher starts to get frustrated. Uh, they start to maybe get frustrated with the admin a little bit to feel like, uh, you know, that they're not, they're not supported, even though the admin's doing everything that they can. I've even had admin, you know, ask the teacher, you know, I know them to be like, what do you want me to do with the kid? I'll do whatever you want. You know, that's the only way I can support you is you pick. Um, and, uh, you know, so, so when teachers get to this point, if they have, you know, a bad, especially if you have a bad mix in your class, or you've just got some kids that are just all feeding off each other, and maybe your classroom management could handle it, or, you know, and maybe it's just one of those situations where it's, it doesn't matter what you do, it's going to be rough. Uh, they, they, you feel non-supported, eventually you're going to feel like you can't teach and you're not effective, and there's nothing worse than feeling not effective at your job. And that's happening to teachers all over the place right now. Yeah. Um, you know, and it can even be dangerous. You know, we, I, if you if you look in the the media right now, it used to be this the campus that I worked at. Um, I always tell people, you know, they those kids just in my last semester there sent me to the ER twice um, because it was a therapeutic campus, and that was you know that was very common. There was a lot of restraints, and you know, kids would just you know they would go into crisis very quickly and easily. And I was working with some big high school kids, and um, and that used to only happen at places like that where we had special campuses for that behavior. Now you see it happening all over the place. You know, people, teachers are getting hurt. Um, so, you know, you, you, if you, they feel unsafe and they feel like there's no uh, discipline, you know, that's, that's effective on their campus, then it, at some point it just feels like you're just playing school. And when you get into that situation, you, you're probably going to leave. Um, or, you know, you can only do it for so many, you know, you can only just say, well, one more year so many times before you just say, I'm not going to do this anymore. I'm going to find something else. Yeah. So, you know, I hate to end that on a, on a negative note, but, you know, Carl's is so positive. We, we can have the opposite of that situation if we have a functional ISS room. You know, the teacher feels supported. And not only do they feel supported, but what Carl's talking about is, you know, you're taking something off their plate because they've got 45 minutes with a kid. Um, you know, times seven classes, we've got all day. So what we can do in that time is not only make sure that they're caught up on the, on the zeros and assignments that you've been harping on them to get done and trying to get, you know, them, them passing, we make sure all that happens. And, you know, then we'll even go back and work on some skills that they're missing because it's very easy for us to determine, uh, usually just on working one-on-one -on -one with them on their regular school work, what skills they're deficient in. Uh, so, you know, then we send them back better. And that's a much better situation for a teacher. They're going to feel like, oh, this is great. This is, you know, the, the kid came back better. And they, they get used to it pretty quick. You'd be surprised uh, into where, you know, if you, if you take that away, uh, then they're going to let you know um, very quickly that, that uh, they're, you know, that this is, that the ISS is not up to their expectation. Awesome. Thank you, Jonathan. And you know what? A little bit. Uh, we're at the tail end of the of the show right now. Quick shout out to Mel, joining from South America and to Jefe, part of the Fantastic Four. Fantastic Four, Principal Cafeta. Thank you for being here. Uh, Jonathan, talk to us real quick. Tell tell the audience out there. Show them if you got a copy of the book. Where they could get the book. How could they uh, reach out to you? Some of the important parts of it. Uh, sure. So I the book is on Amazon. It's the Art of In School Suspension. Um, uh, a discipline program for that works for students and staff. Um, that I don't happen to have a copy of it on on my desk right now, unfortunately. You want to type, uh, type you it can, in? Type it into the uh, communication. One of you guys type it in so they can be out there. So if there's a link, yeah, to it, that'd be great. Carl, uh, yeah, if Carl, if you don't mind, copy and paste the the Amazon link if somebody wants to get it. Um, awesome. And uh, yeah, and um, you can find it anywhere books are sold, uh, as, as far as I know. How long did it take you guys to write the book? I mean, I don't have time in the day to even even uh, go for a walk some days. And you guys are writing books for crying out loud. That's fantastic. I love that you've been able to do that. No, it took me uh, just a year to write the uh, the art of ISS. And I, you know, the way I, I had some personal essays that I kind of uh, the way I write is I do a personal kind of a 
a personal anecdote and then I go into the kind of the nuts and bolts of how this works. So every chapter is kind of three parts. It's like personal anecdote, personal experience. Um, here's how to do, here's how to execute uh, is the second part. And then the third would just be like a, um, like a recap. It's awesome. Carl, anything to add there about the book? Anything you'd like to talk to us about? No, I mean, it's uh, it's a great book. Buy it, please, please buy it. Um, and uh, and we do also, um, we do a lot of consulting. So we are looking for, um, you know, anybody is any looking for any support, just go ahead and reach out to us at theartofiss.com. Um, you can send us a message, let us know what it's like at your campus. We do needs assessments. We do, um, we come in and we, we, we do a training on what it is that we do in our rooms to give you functional rooms of ISS. Um, you know, we like to, we, we like to call them transforming them from an in-school suspension room to a learning center. Um, we want it to be that we want it to be a place where, um, you know, it's not just a, you know, hug the kid just to say, Hey, everything is great. And sometimes it is just that. Um, but it's also a, a place to say, you know, hey, this is what's happened. This is why it's happened. You know, with our behavior reflection form, you made this choice. What was it? Um, what was your motivation behind making that choice? And then what could you do next time to still get what you wanted out of the situation, but not get this kind of consequence? So, um, yeah, that's it. Think about it from punitive to restorative, man, transformative. This is what we have to do in public education. Shame on us if we're still sitting back on our heels and just using the room to waste time for kids. Every moment with a child is an opportunity for them to learn something. And if we don't jump on that, Josh, what good are we as leaders? It, it, it's alpha and omega with the chair. So it's crucial out there, gentlemen, or young ladies that are in charge of the chair, that how are you spending your time to make sure and this is my inner Hispanic doesn't come out right sometimes. Recidivism. Sometimes if you have a lot of kids going back and forth to ISS, obviously, hey, as uh, Superintendent Clark says, if the dance floor is empty, change the <laughs> song, baby. So obviously the definition of insanity, if you keep on getting Josh, Jamal, Mary over and over in their classrooms, ISS, then you as the administrator are not doing something for the culture and climate of the campus and supporting the whole idea. So if you need those details, reach out to these two gentlemen right now. Jonathan, Carl, thank you for being here tonight. But hey, Dean, Dean. Josh. It's not over. Tuesday. Hello. Tuesday. What do we have on Tuesday, Dean? Office hours, Josh. What is what is the topic on office hours? Anything to do with suspension? No, Dean. You know Good. we don't reveal it till the day of the show, I sir. know that. You're like Fort Knox. I say that all the time. Never. How long is that show, sir? 20 minutes, 2-0, 20 minutes. 20 minutes, problem solving mm -hmm. show, asking you who wants to sit in the chair or who sit in the chair, what would you do? Thank you for being here, Carl. Thank you for being here, Jonathan. Dean, that's my story, and I'm sticking to it, sir. You always do. Hey, really, Carl, Jonathan, thank you so much. We appreciate what you do, and we appreciate the systems that you've created to help other districts and schools become better at managing child uh, children's decisions think about that for a second that's what it's all about this is a learning team when you all come together and think about what's best for kids hey guys listen if you're out there you get a chance reshare this out retweet it out make sure because there's some really good nuggets here gentlemen stay on for a moment we thank you very much another one in the books josh tobar number 106 with carl and jonathan in school suspension revitalized have a great week everybody be good to those kids because they deserve the best you possible